welcome back to another installment of Buford Pusser, The Other Story. Uh, with me again today is Dennis Hathcock. Dennis, uh, glad you could be here again. Glad to be here. Uh, let me bring things back into perspective just a little bit. Uh, I had you on a couple of weeks ago. You told about uh, what happened prior to uh, uh, the ambush the night before. And then uh, in the last ep uh, episode or installment, I had, uh, we discussed LeVon Plunk and uh, Ward Moore and what they knew about the ambush, uh, you know, at that time. And so this brings us up to a point where the ambush has occurred. Uh, and so Dennis, what can, let's start out with your part in after the ambush how you got involved. Go ahead. Uh, well, like a, the other one where we ended, I went home, went to sleep. My granddaddy came in there and woke me up. Uh, he said, uh, get in there, Johnny. Johnny says he's got to talk to you on the phone. And I said, for what? I just, it hadn't been two or three hours since we was to get, what does he want? He said, I don't know what he said. He said he's uh says it's a matter of life and death. <laughs> I got up and I said, Yeah, what is it, Johnny? He said, Oh, I said somebody uh ambushed Pusser last night and they killed Pauline. And they don't think he's gonna live. And, and uh, I, what did you do at that point? Well, I asked him where it happened. I I didn't believe it. If you don't know the truth, I just didn't believe it. I thought it was something somebody to come to find out. One of the deputies had come by and told his dad. His dad uh, and Pusser were in a little business together, kind of. So. Uh, it seems like Buford was in business with everybody. I mean. Yes, he was. <laughs> he uh, had things going with uh, Johnny's dad. He had things going with. Uh, Oh, Rod Province, you know, uh, right. dealing with cars. He had things going, I guess, with uh, uh, or had things going with one of his deputies, uh, uh, Tommy Brown. And, That's uh, right. Business about firearms. It seemed Buford had a lot of things going on that a lot of people aren't right. aware of. Right. And uh, it's important to know that. But, okay, at this point, you understand there's been an ambush. Uh, that uh, Pauline's dead, and uh, you know where it happened. What did you do next? Uh, well, I, I didn't know. I, I got around. And I said, where did it happen? He told me over on New Hope Road. Well, I mean, I knew New Hope Road like the back of my hand. So, I mean, it wasn't very far from my grandmother and granddaddy's house. So I said, well, I'm going to go over there. Won't you come down here? He said, okay. So I took off on the motorcycle and went through a field road, and I was on New Hope Road in probably five, five, ten minutes after I left. Anyway, I turned back right before it came into New Hope Road there, and I went over a little hill, and there in front of me sat uh, R.C. Matlock. He was a deputy of Hussers, and he had his car pulled across that little bridge down there so i go down to pull up down there and rc said uh hey cop said what are you doing here i said well questions what are you doing here and he said well they had a am ambush uh buford last night they don't think he's gonna live and they kill pauline i said where did it happen he said Right here, right here, where, where I'm at. Let me ask you something. What made, do you have any idea why R.C. Matlock went to that bridge, the first ambush site? Uh, they, I don't know. I really don't know why of all people they'd have him down there. But, I mean, he lived at Rain. Yeah. Uh, but th th he had another deputy that lived not two miles or three miles from there that I never did understand either why he didn't 
just send him down to the so-called disturbance to begin with. But uh, yeah, um, you know, I guess what uh, I've never understood, and I can't seem to find out why R.C. Matlock knew to go to the bridge. But anyway, he's there. Uh, what did you see that he was doing? He wasn't doing anything except standing there at that bridge and walking around and walking around the car. And, and I said, well, how do you know? That? How, why? He said, oh, I said, uh, one of the deputies talked to him. And before we, they, they took him to Memphis, he told that they had taken him to the med in Memphis or something and said that one of the deputies talked to him. And uh, that he told him it was happened on New Hope Road there. At that little, br I guess he told him at that little bridge. But anyway, okay, let me let me uh, say something here about keep things in proper context. Now, of course, the ambush happened on New Hope Road, but they actually found Buford and Pauline uh, in East Eastview there at Alan McCoy's uh, store. Right, and so obviously there's some time that uh, went on between the time of the ambush, the time that they found. Uh, uh, Buford and Pauline there and you know the time that the deputies had a chance to find out then that that bridge was an ambush site so we've got an expansion of time here we don't know how long that uh, time is but it's it's a while and yeah you know I do know that the TBI and uh, Jim Muffet established that the ambush occurred somewhere around 445 now everybody wants to say that uh it happened later but that is what uh you know was established as the approximate time of the ambush was 445 and so as we both know it would have been dark at that time oh, sure. all right go ahead now uh did uh rc matlock have any shell casings any any evidence that anything had happened there I understand nope. he had one on a pencil, and it was no, 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 no. That was when I came back. Okay, right there, there was about nothing. That. Okay, Tell when I was back, start from what happened at the bridge and move forward. Okay, when I was standing there at the bridge, I said, "Well, what, what, why? What? I mean, what do you, what have you found it?" He said, "Well, he said right there, look right there, and it was a little old pile of glass. About it might have been that big." About like if he broke a vent window out of a car. Okay. He said, well, I'll tell you what, you better get your butt out of here. Uh said the bunch of they're rolling their way down here. I said, Who? He said, Oh, there's gonna be all kinds of car all kinds of people down here in a few minutes. They're on their way right now, and you don't need to be here. I said, Okay. So I left, went on down the the road there toward the state line. I got about two miles down the road and the hell there in the road was all kinds of glass start from about the middle of the road all up and down through there. There were some shell casings, hulls or whatever you want to call them that started from about the middle of the road and went at about a four four o'clock angle down through there over to the side other side of the road and they uh then on that side there was probably three or four shells together and the other holes were just a line of them down through there so i pull over get off my motorcycle kick the kick stand down I get off on the right side of my motors, and right there's a ditch. And uh, what's in, one thing is kind of important in this: they had just put a white flag on that road on right. the day before. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, they had just put it on there, and that slag was that deep on that road. So I mean, you could it was snow white so you could see all, everything down through there easy when i went to get off the ditch they had they had cleaned it out with a grater there 
I just happened to look over and uh, I saw something that I, I wasn't positive of what it was, but it looked like a piece of skull about about this size. And part of a, a scalp from the, me standing there looking at it so long, it was like part of her scalp was still attached to it, and that blonde hair was streaking out from it and had blood and something. It was just blood, bloody, and the scalp was bloody and all that. They already at, at that point, what did you do? Well, to be honest, I stood there and looked, I couldn't believe anyway there was a uh, I guess it was brain matter that was scattered around it there. And I uh I mean I, I, I can see it just like it I can see it just like it was yesterday, but uh anyway I I thought, hell, I guess they're telling the truth because I really thought it was some kind of mess pusser had made up and to and so I walked over there to the road. And I looked at those shell cases and those casings going down through there. And uh, all that glass that was there. And I, I walked right over the edge of the road where there were, like I said, there's about three or four in, in a little pile. Not many, but there was three or four. But not let me like ask that. you, this was, okay. on, this was on the uh, uh, far side of the road from where... Pesser's car would have been. Right, right. And kind of trail back in to the road a little bit. Right. Well, say the east side of the road. Okay. Because that road runs north and north south. And south. So it would have been the east side. And of course, the scout, her, her skull was over on the west side in the in the little ditch that was now, over there. Now I guess what's important to point out here is that Buford's story about the ambush was that uh, he had stopped at that second ambush site. And he opened the door, had one foot out, was going to check on, uh, said he was going to go around, check on Pauline. And he's in several articles, he he's said, they were on me again. And they pulled up right beside him and stopped. Now, it wasn't like they drove by or anything like that. They pulled up and stopped. And the gunman is sitting in the front seat of that Cadillac right next to Pusser's car. And he fires something like 14 to 17 shots at that point. And uh, let's talk for a moment about where those shell casings should have been. Well, there's no way they could have been where they were at if that happened. Now, I would have expected to find them in between the area of where the two vehicles were if the gunman was sitting in the front seat of that car. Some of them may have been ejected inside the Cadillac, and yeah, there's a good possibility that some may have, you know, because we're only talking three or four feet here. Right. Uh, after the windows were blown out, some of them could have been ejected even over into Pusser's car. Over into it, right. But they found them all right there on the roadway. And right. on the far side of the road from Pusser's car. Anyway. Getting back to the story of what occurred for you that morning, after you see all this, what did you decide to do? Well, I, I, I thought, well, hell, I need to go back up there and tell RC that that's not that they need to come down here and, and, you know, I, I, I guess I had enough something. I, I had the thought that if there's any traffic coming through here, it's going to screw this whole thing. It's going to make mess everything up. You know, they need to get somebody down here to protect this scene. And, uh, I mean, sight. So I rode back up there as fast as I could get up there. I come up, come up there, and I said, "RC." He said, "I thought I told you to. You better get out." I said, "Well, 
I'm telling you, this is not where it happened. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, it happened on down the road here. Uh, I said, you know where that old black cemetery is that's on the right? And he said, yeah. I said, uh, I said it happened right down there. He said, well, right here is where, they, where Buford said it happened. So, uh, I, you know, and he said, I told you to get out of here. And I said, okay. He said, they're fixing to be here any minute. I said, okay. And I pulled around the back of the car, around through there. And when I, when I did, here they come, sure enough, over that hill. It was a, oh, a highway patrol. It was uh, all kinds of cars coming down. I mean, a string of cars, probably when, 10 or 12 cars. When, when they all got down there, they're looking at the uh, alleged ambush scene at the bridge. And what do investigators think there? Well, they all come. You, you can see in the picture over there. They all come and they stood around and RC is telling them this and that. And then Pete, he come from somewhere. He, he wasn't there at first. And then he come from somewhere. And he got to tell them, Here's where it happened. They was snipers over here. And you can see in that picture a little bit. It wasn't like it is now. Yeah. You're talking about other this side, picture right here. Right, right. On the other side of the bridge. There. Today, it's all big and tree, trees. But it wasn't then. There was a place there that had a bunch of grass and stuff that was up pretty tall and everything. And well, it's been 57 years, so things have changed. Yeah, yeah. And he, he run over there and, oh, here's where they're, here's where there's at. So they're waiting on him to come down through here. I, I'm sitting on my motorcycle there thinking, what, well, you know, no, it's not, but I didn't say a word. I just sit there. So he, uh, yeah, there's a picture of him showing him walking up, or I think the picture shows him walking back from what. Oh, he said, oh, he all knew all about it, that the snipers was there, and he got over there stomping around in that grass and looking for stuff, he claimed. And I guess about that time when Johnny got down there and he come walking up there and was standing there with me at the motor, I said, can you believe that if they, that 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 they'd be out there stomping around and 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 destroying if it was any evidence at all out there they've destroyed every bit of it by stomping around where all well, that is let me ask you this they didn't find any shell casings up there where Petey was no, uh -uh. no. Uh, okay at the, at what point did you Bring it to their attention. Well, uh, I knew better. I knew, listen. I knew better than to say anything to any of them because I know there's all in on all kinds of stuff with Pusser and everything. And so I mean, they'd be like telling him, you know. But uh, Warren Jones, he came walking down through there. Him and us. Uh, Sloan that was with the TBI and I guess I didn't know who Bill Way was but I guess Bill Way must have had to have been coming down through there somewhere to have got that picture but anyway uh, Mr. Jones Warren Jones walked by and I said uh, I, I knew him and I said uh, uh, Mr. Jones he, he looked and I said this isn't where this happened. He said, what do you mean? I said, he walked over there toward me and Johnny, and he, I said, it happened on down the road here, down at that, where that old black cemetery is down here, uh, and there's a road comes in, I, and I didn't know what the name of the road was, but anyway, and uh, he said, why do you say that? And I said, well, there's all kinds of glass in the road down there, and I said, there's holes uh, scales up and down, up and down the road there and I said and I'm not sure but I I think part of her head is over there in that 
ditch that's over on the right side of the road. Okay, at what point did you guys go down to that site? Well, they stood around over there a pretty good time, and he listened to all that bull that Petey was telling them all about how it happened here and it happened there, and of course, R.C. was running, and he had a 22 casing that he had, a uh, shell, a uh, hole that he had found, you know, and he added up on a pencil like they do in the movies. You know? And he he had showed it to me when I first pulled up, and I said, well, R.C., that's been here for 100 years. It doesn't turn green and cankered and everything. And uh, so anyway, uh Warren, Mr. Jones, turned around, and I guess they was going back to the car. I, I don't, I'm not sure where he was going, but he come back by, and he said, now, where did you say that was? And I said, it's down the road here. I told him again where it was at. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just go down there where it's at, and I'll sit there. And he said, okay. I went down there and waited. And the first one that got there was a highway patrol car. And I never have figured out how that happened, but the highway patrol car came from the other way and stopped. And then just right after he got there, then they all come down there and there, Jim Moffitt and uh, Warren Jones and uh, oh, Paul Hayes, I mean, uh, Terry, Terry Abernathy was up there at the bridge too. I don't remember seeing him down there at the site at, at the site for the ambush site. Second ambush site. Uh but then, then there was a two or three highway patrolmen down there and I guess probably Reed may have been there. I don't know. But uh and and when they got there, they didn't even come over there to me and I thought, well I need to get my butt out of here. I don't need to be here. They found it. I left. So and they didn't back. ask you for a statement or anything at that point in time? Nope. Okay. Sure didn't. It, a lot of this just amazes me that there's so well, much I, of that investigation that they didn't do. Well, let, let, let me stop you for a minute. The TBI verified what I'm fixing to tell you. Because everybody says, well, why didn't you tell this? And why didn't you tell that? You forgot to remember, I won but about a 16, 17-year-old kid. I drove to Jackson, Tennessee, and went to the FBI. They had an office there. Uh, there was a guy, the agent's name, last name was Raspberry. I asked to speak to him. He came out. I told him who I was and that what had happened, and I wanted to tell him. He didn't pay no more attention to what I was telling him than, uh, you, you know, if uh, he didn't, uh, I don't know how to say it. He just did it the same and said, okay. And uh, that's it. So, no one got your statement at that point in time. No. You'd, you'd found the ambush scene. Uh, you saw what you saw, and nobody asked you anything. No, no. And I, let me, I didn't try to tell anybody, like the deputies or nobody right. like that, because, you know. Well, you know, it's like last week. Uh, we we discussed when we were talking about Pauline and uh, LaVon and uh, like LaVon was saying, uh, she couldn't talk to, she couldn't call the sheriff's office and yeah. report what that she knew uh, had gone on there because Carl Pusser would have been the one to take the call. And that was Buford's father. So that wasn't going to do her any good. She couldn't tell uh, her husband, Petey, because uh, you know, when I interviewed her uh, one time, she told me, said, well, if I had told Petey anything, he would have covered for Buford. And right. I had a family to raise. I had kids and uh, I didn't need him getting in trouble, or, you know, lying for Buford. So 
you know, she's uh, she went home that night, and uh, after hearing the gunshot coming from the Pesser residence and all that, and, you know, she didn't know who to call, what to do. She was kind of in a quandary like you were. Right. Well, I mean, I done figured out that an a, a idiot could have looked at what happened and figured out that it didn't hap like, happen like Buford Pusser told it did. I mean, I'm a 16-year-old kid, and I a, a nut could have figured it out. But that's when I decided there was some reason that maybe the TBI wasn't. So I decided I'd go to the FBI. Do you think that uh, there was political interference with this, either at the local or the state level? Well, something had to interfere with it. I, that's all. That's all only thing. I, and you know, uh, you know who was. You know, it, it, through my yeah. research, I've kind of come to the conclusion that uh, everything almost was the opposite of what the movie showed. You know, because in the movie it showed Walking Tall, it showed that the uh, uh, state line syndicate you know, had all the uh, politicians in their pocket. Well, in reality, it seems like Buford was the one that had the uh, support of the politicians, not the state liners. Well, you know, I, I mean, he's dead, so, and I don't want to dishonor him because I, I I met him a time or two, and I thought he was a pretty good guy, oh, guy you know, from talking to him. But Ray Blanton at that time, had a lot of pull, and he became governor of Tennessee. I always thought he may have been the one that stopped the investigation. Well, if I'm not mistaken, you know, he would, he had been a U.S. representative at that point. Right. And he was going to appoint Pusser over the highway patrol and everything. He would have been over what back then we call the T. Now we're called the TBI. But back then, it was a part of the highway patrol. Right. They were and, uh, you, and, and then you've got to realize uh, on that that uh, he was the only governor that Tennessee's ever had that got, uh, what do you call it? Indicted and, and no, uh, uh, removed from office, impeached. What impeached. Only governor that's ever been impeached for there. And of course, they made a movie about him. And in that movie, uh, you know, and here I am being like some of these people on Pusser, but it, you know, they uh, made out like he was involved in having some people killed and all that. Like so I don't know if that's true. He got in trouble. Uh, his administration was basically into a lot of things, but part of it was uh, basically selling. Paroles and uh, such yeah. to to yeah. prisoners, right? At any rate, uh, Dennis, we need to be wrapping this up, but uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of catch what you had to say about this. You know, like I pointed out, you got proof here that you and Johnny were there uh, because you're right there in that photo with the investigators. And right. you know, there's a lot of haters out there that want to doubt what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't hate Pesser like a lot of people think I do. I just want to get down to the truth. And uh, people are saying, well, you didn't interview this person. You didn't interview that person. So, you know, that's where I started this uh, Voices from the Past, where I'm, you know, uh, releasing some excerpts of some of the conversations right. I've had. And last week was one with LeVon. So uh, at any rate, uh, we're going to have to wrap well, this up I'll because we're running out of time. Well, I'll say this. Of course, I didn't have no love for Pusser, but I thought a lot of Pauline. Right. And, of course, Diane. Me and Pidge were good friends. I thought a lot of them. And uh, it, It's the just a wild needs, story. The truth needs to be told. Well, Dennis, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm sure that we'll get back together again at some point with these because, uh, you know, uh, there's still a lot to discuss, a whole lot to discuss. Yeah. Right. All right. Appreciate you All being right. here. Hey, thank you. All right. Okay. And 
we will catch you a little later. Hey, everybody, I'd like to remind you that the Buford Pusser Festival takes place this May 9th, 10th, and 11th in Adamsville, Tennessee at the park. There will be a bus tour on the 11th, I understand. I would encourage everybody to go. While we may not hold the same beliefs about the Pusser legend, uh, it's no reason for us not to enjoy a good time. You don't have to believe everything that people tell you there. Nobody knows the uh, whole story. Um, certainly, a lot of people don't know the truth, but uh, still yet, interesting time to see things, enjoy the event, and uh, hope everyone attends. I might also add that next week we're going to get into a discussion about the evidence that was found at the ambush scenes and a lot of things that were missed. I'll have a guest on here to uh, go over that. So I hope you'll join me. Thanks. <laughs>